MG, one of the most popular marks and probably one of the best-known set of initials in the world. It's the initials of Morris Garages, founded by William Morris in Oxford, England. The MG story started back in the 1920s, when Cecil Kimber, who was the general manager of Morris Garages, saw the potential of uprating Morris saloons and branding them to stand out. And so, the MG legend was born. And owning a classic mark today can mean more than just driving it from A to B. To some, it's a hobby. To others, you could say it's more a way of life. The success of the MG is largely due to the car clubs, such as the MG Owners Club, formed in 1973. And one that's almost as old as the mark itself, the MG Car Club, founded in 1930. Well, it all started because a man wrote to a magazine called The Light Car in 1930 and said, look, all these chaps with these new little MGs, which had only come out 28, 29, are waving to each other, no flashing headlights in those days. They were waving to each other. Why don't we get together and form a club? Well, when it started, the purpose of the club was to provide entertainment and uh, bonhomie and what have you for MG owners. The whole thing's a voluntary club operation that has a magazine once a month. And we uh, also have a trade scheme whereby we vet MG traders. Now, by that, I don't mean people who sell MGs new today. I mean the people who do the refurbishment on old models. And uh, they're all vetted so that we don't get any nasty, spivvy people twisting our members around their little thumbs, you know. But MG clubs are not just there to keep a watchful eye out for their members. Our Silverstone event is the biggest one-make car event in the world. Now, that's quite a claim. But when I tell you that uh, this year was our 53rd consecutive Silverstone race meeting, we had 11,000 MGs there, not people, MG cars, plus, obviously, people who came in other cars. We raced 488 cars. We also had a sprint meeting, auto tests, concours d'elegance. We had 100 trade stands, a dinner for 450 people in the evening. What other one make with a club can produce that? This is an MG PB, which I've owned for 10 years now, just over 10 years. And uh, spent the first three or four years uh, restoring her. And, uh, been enjoying her ever since. The capacity of the engine is 939 cc's. The PA which preceded it, known as the P-type then, was uh, 847 cc's. Um, but they, they needed the extra power, so in 1935 they bored the engine out from 57 to 60 millimeters and got uh, a bit more power out of the engine. It's definitely not fast. Um, it basically just brings a smile to your face every time you drive her. Many American servicemen stationed in Britain during the war fell in love with the romantic MG image, and sales boomed in the United States during the early 50s, creating one of the biggest export markets for the MG. Many of today's American owners have also fallen for the quaint, simplistic charms of MGs. And what better place to own them than the sunny state of Florida? Well, this is a 1953 MG TD, uh, the last of the TDs. Uh, uh, there's nothing particularly unusual, there's, there's no accessories or anything on this car, except that maybe the wire wheels are non-standard. Uh, it's a typical period accessory though. I always wanted this car, I'm not so old that uh, this was new when I was young, but I, I always loved the appearance of it. I thought this was both a combination of uh, appearance and sportiness that, that I really, it was attractive to me. Well this is a 1952 MG TD and I acquired it in 1965. It was sitting in absolutely disreputable state at the back of a small car lot. I'd always wanted one since the early 50s when I was in college. The wealthy young college men were driving MGTDs. And I had a bicycle. And I thought, oh, I would love to have a TD someday. And so in 1965, I was able to afford this TD. The negotiated price, I think, after we dickered was $312.50 in 1965. In the late 60s, my wife at the time said, I sure would like one of those little fancy square sports cars, and I, that's all it took. <laughs> and I've had seven or eight different MGs ever since. To me, the thrill is, 
in fixing them up as much as in driving them around. But back in not-so-sunny England, it was time to move MG on with a new look. This was achieved with the then futuristic design of the MGA, which was introduced in 1955. During its first year of production, more than 13,000 were built, injecting a new lease of life into the Mark. And for those enthusiasts who needed more than just two seats to carry the family around, there was the MGZ Magnet Saloon. These cars uh, were the first of the badge engineering, as they called it, from BMC. BMC, in fact, in 1953, produced a car called the Woolsey 444, which had a similar body shell to this. And it was fitted with a 1250cc uh, MG engine to it. It's got those chassis through it, so first of the MGs without a chassis, and it took over from the MGY series, which was a small Morris-bodied uh, car, but uh, quite a delightful little car, the Y series, with a 1250cc engine. The Mark appeared on a variety of mass-produced cars, much to the disapproval of some MG sports car enthusiasts. The Mark IV MG Magnet was the first to offer a modern form of automatic transmission, hardly a sports car. And possibly the most debatable were the MG 1100 and 1300 models, made between 1962 and 1971, with over 140,000 produced. But it was also in 1962 that a new MG sports car hit the showrooms. The new model was to come courtesy of Abingdon's MG design team led by Don Hayter and Sid Enever. Between them, they created one of the most famous and perhaps best loved MGs ever built, the MGB. Between its launch in 1962 and the end of production in 1980, well over half a million were sold. I came to Abingdon in 1956 when the uh, MGA was in production and first jobs I did were, were on, on the things like the twin cam and all sorts of other jobs. But Sid Enever had already got Jimmy O'Neill, who was the chief body engineer, looking at a replacement for the MGA already and had done a model. But it was a very fat, sexy looking thing and it obviously was too big. But he was trying to use the lines from the record breaker, the 181. Um, I took over and did about three or four quarter scales. My initial job, of course, was the outside shapes. And we actually uh, were aiming to keep a lot of, some of the curves of the record breaker in, on the car. And so once we had gone from quarter size to full size, uh, we went to the experimental department at Quinton Road at Coventry, Bodies Branch, and they actually made a complete full-size model in wood but with all the split lines on it so that you could do panel sets off it. This means that you could then make a bonnet or a door or anything using the outside shapes in the wood model. And it was also an enormous advantage because if we were going to go into production, we had to uh, agree all these shapes being feasible, the cut lines and joints, with Prestil, who were going to make the body for us. And the first uh, body in white came back to us. And that is quite something, when you've drawn something from a wooden model, uh, from a quarter scale upwards, and then you see a first body shell shining in the bare metal, no paint on it at all, and you think, oh, that's what I've done. Well, the, the problems were things which were vastly new and different were the windscreen, for instance. Up to then, windscreens had always been uh, brass pillars and brass sections uh, all the way through. The other thing was that we were controlled a bit by Appendix J, which is the height of the windscreen above the scuttle of a car. Um, and we were going to go to Le Mans, weren't we, again sometime. So that uh, there was a dimension, I think it was 125 centimetres or something like that, which we had to, which is why the windscreen on the MGB is a bit low. It is a bit low, but it was controlled by that regulation. And John Thornley wanted to do a, a GT version. So we actually drew a streamlined version of a top and it, the, the lines I'd used were in fact the lines very similar to the ones I'd used when I was Aston Martin. I still got that because I did the first lines of the DB4. Um, we actually did this, but uh, it still didn't look quite right. And John went to one of the motor shows and he talked to um, Farina and said, if we gave you a car, could you do us a top? 
So we gave our lines as much as they were, because that was the package, the size we wanted it, to Farina and sent him a tourer. And back came the GT. Thanks to Abingdon's clever design, the MGB never suffered from the dreaded scuttle shake, which dogged many of its rivals at the time. The result, pure motoring pleasure. There's no doubt the MGB is one of the most popular MGs ever. But what is the appeal that makes people still want to own one today? A lot of people have been asked that through the years and nobody can really answer it. It's, they, it's called the magic of MG. So w when you're talking about magic, you can't explain magic. Magic is something that you can't quite get hold of. And I think that's the way with MGs, you know. It's a very, very difficult question. I cannot give you a definitive answer for it, but um, you get it all together, camaraderie, I suppose, amongst everybody who owns an MG. They've all got the same interest, preserving an old car. That, that could be looking after a piece of history. The cars are nice, but we, we think the social scene is really, really great. A couple of benefits spring to mind to being a member of any uh, car club is the uh, source of uh, spares in that because a lot of these clubs um, manufacture and source out all parts that you want. MG is big business and being a member of an MG club can bring many other benefits too, including spares and accessories. But do you need to join a club to own a classic? Obviously it's possible to run any classic car without being a member of an owner's club. MGs appeal to people from a very, very wide section, from impoverished students to members of the royal family. There is no uh, definition of wealth or class or position with MG. It appeals to so many people. With age groups too, we've got members who are in their teens, we've got one lady member who will not be part of her MG BGT, and she's 85. I wanted MG owners to get together so we could trade in MG parts, uh, trade information, and when we wanted parts, we could buy from one another. And that's how the club was formed and why it was formed originally. We're in the club shop, uh, as you can see, and uh, we've got a whole range of items uh, to appeal to the MG owner. Um, big range of uh, clothing, all, all the modern fashions. But it's new parts that keep the cars on the road, and in order to get new, you often have to recycle the old. Right, we're now outside in the yard, and as you can see, we've got cages here with uh, old parts that can be recycled. Uh, in fact, we don't throw anything away if it's at all serviceable. It goes back into the supply chain after it's been uh, completely overhauled with new parts. So this is core stock that's going to go off to a remanufacturer, uh, ensuring continuity of supply. It's thanks to these clubs that thousands of MG owners can keep their cars on the road and are able to continue showing them for the world to enjoy. Some cars, however, should never need to worry about replacement parts. This 1980-built MGB GT has never been on the road and has covered just 58 miles. In fact, it hasn't even been registered. It's exactly as it left the factory. It's uh, never been used. The, uh, the spare is uh, pristine. But then with a car that's uh, never been on the road, so are all the other tyres. Yeah, this has got twin SU carburetors, but this time instead of uh, 850 cc's, you've got 1800 uh, cc's. Uh, but again, as you can see, this car has never been used. Uh, it's been in uh, a dehumidified garage all its life. Uh, it's even got the spare key screwed onto the uh, bulkhead there. I saw the car in uh, Gray's garage in Hatfield, and uh, it was. Uh, it appealed to me because I'd always wanted one of these cars when I was uh, 20 years old. The, the MGB came out in uh, about 1966, I can't remember exactly when, and uh, that was the age when uh, it was the car to have. Um, but unfortunately it was the age when uh, I wasn't earning very much money, so it was always something that I'd wanted. Um, Gray's garage had kept the car uh, since new, and uh, it came out about uh, five years after uh, they'd stopped producing it. I had a look at it and uh, kept driving past it and in the end uh, went in and bought it and uh, then it seemed such a shame to actually register it and put it on the road so uh, it's been tucked up in the garage. Um, I collect quite a few cars but uh, MGs have always been uh, a love of mine and uh, although I would have perhaps slightly preferred a convertible um, 
I still don't think it's worth putting the uh, the, the uh, shells on and, and converting it. I think this will be a classic in its own right in due course. The biggest export market for the MGB was the States, but radical changes were needed to keep it there. The problem was that we had to pass regulations which suited American cars, and the bumpers were at 20 inches high. Where our, what we wanted was a bumper of about 12 inches high, so that if you hit somebody, you hit them on the, the leg below the knee and tip them over the bonnet, and they don't hurt themselves. You hit somebody with an American car, you smash the kneecap and drive over them afterwards. So we had to raise the MGB, so we lifted it on suspension an inch, and we lifted the front bumper section another inch and a bit to get it up to pass the reg American regulations. It was, and it put about over 100 weight onto the car in weight to make it that much stronger. Okay, I've owned the car since about 94, 1994. This is a 1980 MGB limited edition. When I got it, it was a basket case. I've uh, rebuilt it completely, restored it. I got a 3.5 liter Rover V8 with a Rover 5-speed transmission with the MGV8 rear end, the 307 rear, uh, rear axle. I just drive this car almost every day. We, it's just a good, good, dependable car now. The, most, uh, the best thing I ever did to it was uh, completely rewired it uh, with a, what they call quick wire harness and modern fuses. And uh, other than that, this car does nothing but runs. Just a fun car to drive. Uh, you can't go two blocks without somebody waving at you and hollering at you, wanting to know about your car. Uh, you about wore out the bonnet hatch latch because every time you stop, somebody wants to see the V8 engine. These are the Pontiac Fiero bucket seats. Uh, I have them covered with the leather from uh, Mike's upholstery, and it's covered in the Ferrari pattern with the new padding and everything. A very comfortable seat. Uh, I say I drove about 1,200 miles in it uh, a couple of months ago, and it was driving a new car. It felt like because you didn't get tired, they just drive well. Making the necessary changes to the MGB in 1974 to meet legislation well and truly paid off, as in 1977, sales of the MGB to America increased by 33% to nearly 23,000. Okay, guys, I just drive mine. I don't care if it's paid. <laughs> if it runs, great. If it runs, that's fine. But with so many luxurious cars to choose from, what was it the Americans found so appealing about this small British sports car? It's just something about them, something about owning the car, the, the history of the car, um, you know, all the awards and uh, speed records and everything else that had broken. It, it just seemed like it was the car. Well, for one thing, I'm from Wyoming, and it's very, very cold there. So I like to call my friends and tell them I'm driving around in the convertible, and it's gorgeous out, and they're snowed in, and here I am having lots of fun. I have people yelling at me and talking to me as I drive by. Um, my husband put Christmas lights on the car for me, and let me tell you, they were blinking. They were wrapped around the back, down the front, across, back. I mean, you could see me coming for miles. I absolutely love the car. Love driving it. Love owning a small sports car. But lack of investment in the late 70s, coupled with a soaring pound, was to signal the end of MGB production. The final 1,000 cars to be produced for the UK market were these limited edition bronze and pewter models. The last one to roll down the line in October 1980 was this car, seen here on display at the Heritage Centre at Gaydon. Seeing the car finishing in production and, and the factory closing and walking through the factory with all the little noises and no production going on, it was dreadful. But then the car carried on, the cars carried on. The clubs have been wonderful. I mean, they've, they've actually you know, supported people running their cars and you can get more bits for MGB than nearly any motor car. When you think about the reasoning, it was Sir Michael Edwards who was chairman at the time, and he came down and closed MG immediately after a weekend celebrating its uh, 50 years in Abingdon, really. But he closed it. His predecessor, Lord Stokes, had spent an estimated £70 million then, a lot of money, on the development of the TR7. Now, if you spent £70 million developing a sports car, would you develop another one to compete with it in your own group? because I wouldn't, but I think that's why Michael Edwards had to close Abingdon, because it obviously wasn't going to make money in competition if that car had taken off. 
Well, this is one of the last group of uh, prototypes built to take the O-series engine um, in full emission uh, gear for America, passing all the bumper tests and all the other safety tests, but also giving you extra, a lot extra horsepower because the MGB engine, in fact, had got so weak with the catalyst and the um, exhaust uh, port air injection that we were only getting about 74 horsepower. Whereas uh, with a fuel injection, we were getting 112 horsepower in absolutely standard form. And uh, it made the bee a lot quicker. But we were given no money at all to alter the body on it. Um, so all we put was, was some side stripes on it. And I've still got a set of those side stripes in the garage. Um, but this engine here, I kept in the back of the stores, covered under a sheet of plastic. And when the factory was closing, and I'd got all these cars with no engine in. I bought the engine and I bought a body and dropped it in, had it dropped in myself. It is the only um, MGB which came um, out of development with a V8 engine in a Tourer. All other V8s from the factory were GTs. This is the only Tourer. But the MG Mark was not going to stay away for long, and just two years later, with unregistered MGBs still in some showrooms, the MG Mark was back, only this time on a family saloon, the MG Metro, followed by MG versions of the Montego and the Maestro. They signal the beginning of the hot hatch era, and whether you liked or loathed them, no one can deny the introduction of these saloons kept the Mark alive. Although there was an increase in engine performance, it was mainly the cosmetic changes that made these cars stand out from the standard saloon versions. Metro Maestro Montego developed into very useful motor cars and uh, the enthusiasm was still there for the mark and the people who were running BM at the, uh, BLM at that time realised this and it became Austin Rover I think about this time the company did and uh, they accepted that there was this demand for the Octagon still and uh, the car was quite successful really. All three saloons had turbo versions, but the Metro was perhaps the most popular, with a staggering 22,000 turbo models produced. Despite the success of the modern saloons, yet again some hardened enthusiasts felt they were an insult to the mark and were determined to keep their dream of the two-seater sports car alive. One of the ways this has been achieved is by sourcing parts at various auto jumbles worldwide, like this huge annual event at Bewley Motor Museum in Hampshire, England. Auto jumbles give you a chance to buy parts, but it's annual shows like this one at Alexandra Palace in London that give you a chance to see the cars being kept on the road, like this restoration by the MG Owners Club. Well, this um, MGB GTV8 actually is it's my personal car, which was uh, involved in an accident a few months ago, uh, so it was a bit of a forced rebuild. It's being rebuilt uh, slightly non-standard. Throughout the duration of the show we've uh, built up all the running gear, the front axle, the rear axle and uh, put the engine and gearbox in place. The engine in this is a 4 litre current spec uh, Rover V8 which we're using in place of the original 3.5 litre and we're mating the new with the old, uh, the old bits from the Carburetta MG and the new bits relating to the front of the V8. Well, what you're looking at is that the original MG was three and a half litres. It was only rated at 137 horsepower with just under 200 foot-pounds of torque. Now, with the same induction and exhaust system, what we'll be looking at here is around 200 horsepower and around about 240, 250 foot-pounds of torque, so the differences are obvious. At the end of the day, you could probably invest £12,000, £14,000 in a project like this, uh, and you've got a really stunning car at the end of it and uh, the performance to go with it. Eight years after the last MGB rolled off the production line, brand new MGB body shells, amongst others, were being manufactured here at the British Motor Heritage Centre in Oxfordshire, England. But had it not been for its managing director, the MGB legend may not have lived on. No sooner did I join the Trust and move to the Midlands from an Oxford base than the part managing director of uh, BL Heritage, as it was then, left the company, retired, and I took on the responsibility of BM Heritage. The company at that time was purely a, a, a seller of redundant and obsolete stocks from uh, the Rover Group of companies, BL, and from Unipart. The concern by the management 
of British Motor Heritage was that using their components and panels, rebuilds were being done which were not up to the standard, quality or even safety of the original car. And it was a, a major step but a quick decision to decide that the best thing to do was to make shells available to classic enthusiasts. Back into the plants that originally assembled the MGB body and I found most of the tooling was still available. This was spread over the country from Newcastle, Swindon, Clenethley, uh, several Midlands companies and progressively I got enough confidence in finding this tooling which had been laid outside for a number of years and had not improved with the weathering that it was receiving but I got the confidence that we could put together a body. I then found all the original PP&A sheets which are production parts and assemblies detail which enabled me to get the full bills of material for these vehicles. The staff that we employed in Heritage were all original factory people who'd worked on, many of them had worked on the original product when it was in build at Swindon Cowley or wherever at Abingdon. And that was one of the major features of our facility was the skill and knowledge that those staff brought to our products. Peter's putting together the, the sub-assemblies that he's made earlier into the day uh, and making them up into a complete rear-end assembly. Uh, Paul and Nigel are, are now putting in the APO sill dash side. They're probably about three quarters of the way through building the body now. It'll go into the turnover fixture, mainly for MIG welding. Uh, probably about 75% of the next stop will be MIG welding, but there, there is some um, finished spot welding to do underneath um, along the sill sections. When the body's bolted to the turnover fixture, it allows it to be swung through 360 degrees for all the final MIG welding underneath. Uh, they also do do some finished spot welding outside of the booth. And they're now hanging on the doors, trunk lid and fenders. Uh, they'll do all the metal finish. Probably take about two and a half hours to complete the shell, and then it's ready to go to paint. But there was still a huge gap for a brand new MG sports car. Enter the MG RV8. The RV8 uh, came about with Heritage's uh, input in that obviously having produced the body there was a need to keep the MG mark alive through a, a, a low point in its, in its history when there were no products available and, and the management of the main car company, the Rover car company, and identified that it was a mark they wished to continue with and this was a quick route to market with a, uh, a modern retro vehicle, the RV8. And we hired another small unit, took an original body and put a V8 engine in it with uh, originally a 3.6 V8 engine with electronic, all the latest electronics on it. And we enhanced it with modern brakes. We then gave it to RSP to evaluate the project and see if it was worth going ahead with. Unfortunately for British Motor Heritage, they looked at the project, liked it, liked the product, saw a market for it and produced uh, using our production facility for the body shells. When we put the engine in we couldn't close the original MGB bonnet which was an aluminium one we had on that car and I actually brought in a McVitie's biscuit tin which we cut a hole in and welded in and this car actually ran with this biscuit tin in the top of the bonnet for a period of time. The RV8, we built the shells, they were fully fitted and tested out on fit, uh, gaps, door gaps and metal condition. They were then shipped into Cowley uh, body plant as it was then for painting through the paint process. Then they went into their assembly shop where the engines and trim were, were applied to the body. Just a handful of extremely skilled people worked in the area known as MG Manufacturing at Cowley where the vehicles were all hand-assembled. Truly for me it's a privilege and a pleasure to do it because it's one of the few now hand-built cars. And this car has been going now 12 months with a selected small team of 15 people currently building 15 a week, working as a group responsible for their own quality and their own standards of the car. There is no inspectors, it is an hands-on built quality car. 
each of my associates is very privileged in the sense that he's the expert. I listen to him and I can go in line with his request for quality standards. He knows this car. Following the successful launch of the MG RV8 at the Tokyo Motor Show in 1993, Rover were flooded with orders and Japan actually ended up as the biggest export market. In fact, around 75% of MG RV8s were exported to Japan, with over 300 remaining in the UK and the rest going to Holland, Germany, Belgium, Austria and France. Designed to take advantage of as many existing MGB components as possible, the finished product only actually contained around 5% original materials. Most of the parts were adapted from other Rover products or were brand new. So what does Don Hater think of the changes to his original design? They obviously maintained the using the shapes as well as they could. And I thought, well, jolly good luck. They've got a, a good engine in there and they loaned me one to try. Thoroughly enjoyed it, but I didn't. I wasn't quite sold on the rear suspension. Um, when you go over a bump on a corner, the steer effect is just that bit different. The uh, the B is much more neutral. On the assembly line, the car was slowly hoisted from section to section. Each time, the small workforce would add another component. The biggest of these was the 4-litre Rover V8 engine and Rover R380 five-speed manual gearbox. They were hoisted out of the crate and carefully manoeuvred into the RV8 chassis. After the engine, brake lines, radiator, steering and exhaust were fitted, it was off to have the trim added. Everywhere you looked, it was an MG enthusiast's dream. Brand new MG parts from wheels to luxuriously trimmed full leather seats and interior carpets. The UK market was our main market last, last year, but this year is our concentration on a very important market of Japanese. We all feel pleased that the Japanese market has taken to our car and we're sure they will be pleased when they're driving on Japanese roads and we hope more orders will follow. With the final piece of trim in place, another limited edition MG RV8 is driven off the production line and straight into motoring history. When you take an, an old shell, which was produced prior to computer-aided design, etc., there, there is not always a consistency between the one side and the other side of the body, and certainly the body was not the same length on one side as the other side, and this gave problems initially in getting this, the, the suspension geometry correct. We had to change many features because there were uh, additional componentry added to the body and a number, of probably 50% of the body panels were modified for the MG RV8 from standard MGB production. The only drawback for most potential MG RV8 buyers in the UK was the huge price tag when it hit the showrooms, over 26,000 British pounds. Even so, the press and enthusiasts loved them. The two-seater MG sports car had at last returned together with some old quirks. A car like this, you just cannot resist driving it. However, one problem that I feel lets the car down, and I know dozens of other journalists do as well, and that's, of course, the window. You are seated quite high in the chair, so person my height, all I'm seeing basically when I'm driving is the top of the front window. Now, another problem which I found um, is basically if you've got the sun in your eyes and you pull the visor down, you have one big problem. You can't see. I can see about five inches of road space, let alone any car coming towards me. The second biggest export market was Germany, where over 50 examples of the RV8 were shipped. The MG RV8 was always going to be a limited run model, but it paved the way for the first new MG for 32 years, the MGF. I've had an MGB, I've had a midget, and I've had the, the Bs, and I've had an MGA. Now I'm getting on a few years, I'm not a young man anymore, and uh, I'm enjoying the comfort and the uh, special type of car that the F is. It's really a wonderful car. It is modern, it's comfortable, it's a very nice looking car, very attractive, 
uh, it has the, the, all the refinements that you would have in a modern car, braking, ABS, power steering that is wonderful. As a, it is a modern car, but I'm still driving an MG and I have the support and the friendship and the uh, camaraderie of club members. It's just fantastic. It's a good way to enjoy a sports car. The MGF lasted until 2002 when this car, the TF, was launched. When they hit the showrooms, they once again proved a huge success, becoming the UK's best-selling sports car over six years. The current MG TF is built at MG Rover's Longbridge plant in Birmingham, England. But unlike the small team that hand-built the MG RV8s, these cars are now produced by a workforce of hundreds, building cars at a rate of 430 a week. In fact, the TF completed a new four-model range that had already been introduced at the Geneva Motor Show in February 2001, all designed by MG Rover's new designer, Peter Stevens. The new lineup includes the entry-level model, the MG ZR, based on the Rover 25. Then there's the MG ZS, the mid-range model, based on the Rover 45. And of course, the MG ZT and ZTT, based on the Rover 75, all built at MG Rover's Longbridge factory using state-of-the-art technology. The MG ZT offers for the first time on an MG Mark an estate and of course a four-door option. The vehicle also offers a good engine lineup that ranges from the MG 120's 1.8 to the brand new 260 V8 version, introduced in the late summer of 2003, which has a top speed limited to 155 miles an hour. The ZR is the most affordable of all four MG models now produced. Since it was introduced in July 2001, up until April 2003, around 37,000 ZRs had already rolled off the production line. The mid-range model is the front-wheel drive ZS, which comes in a choice of five-door hatchback or four-door saloon versions. And the top of the range, MG ZS 180, with its two and a half litre petrol engine and a very impressive 0 to 60 time of 7.3 seconds, with a top speed of 139 miles an hour. We're going to go through all the gears to make sure that the gears work. On the screen, I've got a prompt on the screen to say that the test was okay. Final checks completed, another brand new MG ZS 180 leaves the production line and its lucky new owner awaits delivery. The success of the cars in the UK and Europe has been outstanding and there are enthusiasts much further afield that would love to get their hands on the cars. Unfortunately, because of strict legislation, the new saloons have not yet been able to break into the lucrative American market. What do you think of the, the ZS180 there? I mean, any, anything strikes you about the look, the design? Looks like a typical little Econo Ooh. box. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I watched okay. Speed Vision, I watched Race, yeah. Night. Okay, so having a look at that, what do you think of it? I like it. As soon as it gets to the United States, I'll sell them a Cadillac and buy one. <laughs> My wife says no, but that's beside the point. But that's what I want. I want a new one when they get here. They look impressive. 
I haven't driven one or seen one in real life, but uh, I'd like to get one when I get here. Could opinion. you see in 20 years time, 30 years time, people standing here looking at that, you know, with, with one of those cars saying, what a great car it is? Uh, it's according to how much plastics in them. <laughs> Why they last that long? Well, how do you get the top down? Yeah. <laughs> well, it's probably like Model A Ford enthusiasts are not all that ecstatic over a new Ford Focus. Yeah. But these are not your average saloons. They're built for true MG enthusiasts and are truly stunning. Peter Stevens' design work has really paid off. The new MGs are not just for the older generation. The next generation of MG owners are taking to them with great enthusiasm too first kind of impression was that it was it was quite nice I don't like the color um, we were saying very similar to the Rover um, but yeah I think obviously depending on price wise um, possibly go for it um, would appeal I think to people of our age more than the older generation I should imagine because it's quite a sporty looking I think it's a great, I think it's a great looking car um, I think for our age group a Rover tends to be not the car you tend to go for but being a bit more souped up I quite like it um, the features are a little bit over the top, say with the, the spoiler, I wouldn't go for qu something quite so large, maybe a bit more modest than that, but generally um, all round a, a ni nice looking car. MG has a has a kind of, a, I think, an aura about it, especially the little sporty cars, and I think, um, yeah, it would be quite cool to be seen in one of these, not bad, it's all right. <laughs> um, I do like the alloys, like Matt said, I think that they're, they're, they're spot on really, um, sort of thing I'll go for. Um, as, as I said, the trim looks a little bit beefier than the, the normal Rover, um, and it, it, I've seen it about on the road. It's, it's been a, it's a good, good looking vehicle. It's never been one of my f most favourite cars, but I'm sure it could actually grow on me. I, I, li I like the look of it, and uh, you know, going further to have a bit of a drive of it um, may, 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 uh, may force me to, to look to think differently. But RMG is just a secret plaything for the boys to have. No, I don't think. Um, MGs are just for a mark for men only, I think um, it's a woman's car as well. They are modern and sporty and they look nice. The children are very fussy about what they go out in, um, but they definitely go out in this one. The way it looks, the colour, very sporty and I think people look as we drive along the road so they think that's cool. I think I probably could see myself buying another MG, yes. Alongside the introduction of the Z saloons came the rally cars, which spearheaded the revival of MG as a dominant force in motorsport around the world. If you fancy a more extreme and exclusive motoring experience, then the SV is probably the ultimate MG, seen here courtesy of the MG Owners Club. With the option of a 4.6 or 5 litre V8 engine and a top power output of over 400 brake horsepower, performance of the entry model is estimated at 0 to 60 in just 5 seconds, with a top speed of 170 miles an hour. MG is looking to the future. It was the world's favourite sports car. Now, that was a sort of a pseudonym given in the days of the MGB, of which half a million were made. And I think largely because it was affordable, it was safe, it was quick, but not excessively quick. Thornley used to say, design of MG, we make a car that goes well, goes fast, and then we put it into something that handles well and can stop. The whole theme of the mark was, as the uh, expression says, safety fast. <laughs>